Today, we answer a crucial question, which is why is it that we can put a rover on Mars, but Hollywood can't make a realistic film about going to Mars? We're going to talk about how Mars movies get everything wrong about terraforming the red planet. And joining us is Phil Plate of Bad Astronomy, who will be offering his expert opinion on the Mars movies. And is the Martian sky always pink? We'll find out. All of that on this episode of We Come From The Future. This episode of We Come From The Future is brought to you by Gamefly. Welcome to We Come From The Future, the show where we let the future lick our faces even though we have no idea where its mouth has been. I'm Annalee Newitz. And I'm Esther Inglis Arkell. And in this episode, we've invited Phil Plate, the man behind Bad Astronomy, to help us get a scientific perspective on today's highly scientific topic. Oh, by the way, the title of his blog is a misnomer. He is actually good at astronomy, which is why we brought him on. Welcome to the show, Phil. Hey, thanks for having me on. From the future! <laughs> So, in honor of the Curiosity rover landing, we're taking a look at the future habitability of Mars and how movies mess it up. We know that movies play fast and loose with terraforming to serve their stories, and we like it. Why? Because we get to pick at it. And the first movie I'm going to pick, like, it's the school's best kickball player and I'm picking teams. It's Total Recall. And the original... The original, yeah. Yeah, the original. And the original movie ended with, spoiler, spoiler, spoilers, a device pumping oxygen into the Martian atmosphere to make it breathable in like 30 seconds. Phil, Phil? tell us, <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, thanks for throwing me into that mix there. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a mess. Uh, now, to be fair, the end of that movie may have been a dream. That was kind of the point. Uh, but yeah, right now, Mars has an extremely thin atmosphere. It's only about 1%. Of, of the thickness of Earth's air, and it's mostly carbon dioxide. So if you were to go there, you would uh, freeze and suffocate and, and suffocate again. There's not enough air to breathe, and what there is there to breathe, we can't breathe, the carbon dioxide. So at the end of the movie, right, he's making all this air, and they, they, I think in the movie they say oxygen, but I'm, it's not clear. Now, there are a lot of problems with this, of course. Now, it's alien technology, sure. But the point is you have to make enough oxygen and enough air for us to breathe and the problem there is that to make enough air on mars you'd have to make something like a thousand trillion tons of it a thousand trillion tons or a million billion tons if you prefer it in those units so if you can imagine a million tons of something which is a lot now imagine a billion of them mm -hmm. right that's how much air you would need to make that's a lot and it's hard for me to imagine they could do that, even if they could crank out a million tons a second. You know, it would take months and months and months to create an atmosphere on Mars. So, already lying on the uh, Martian surface, uh, going <laughs> like that would have gone on for much longer than the 10 or 15 seconds in the movie. So, one of my favorite movies about Mars is completely unrealistic, and that's Ghosts of Mars. Um, it's a John Carpenter flick, and it's pretty much the best because it has a lesbian-dominated military fighting modern primitives from Burning Man. Let's just leave that aside as a fun flick and then move on to Mission to Mars, where there actually is this weird moment of terraforming. We were talking about this earlier, where the hero, he's trapped on the surface of Mars, but he rescues himself by creating a tent and raising plants in it to create oxygen. And it's just like a regular tent, right? It's not like a special hermetically sealed tent. We're never, we don't really know for sure, but it seems likely that, yeah, it's just a regular little tent and he's raising plants Okay, Phil, what do you think? Is that even possible? Would he have survived with a little set of plants in his tent? Maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I looked this up, and it turns out that uh, if you look at how much oxygen plants make uh, mm -hmm. in a day and how much oxygen a human needs in a day, yeah, actually, a few hundred plants or maybe a few thousand if, if you have a leaky sort of a tent mm. uh, might be be enough to produce enough air for you to breathe. So, hey, you know, maybe, and it's Hollywood, so I'll kind of give them the credit there. 
Uh, on the other hand, like I said, Mars has almost no atmosphere compared to Earth. It's, it's there, but it's much lower pressure. So you would need a, uh, some sort of chamber or something that is very tightly sealed, because if you were to fill this thing up with enough air pressure for you to breathe, whoosh, it would all blow out like the air out of a balloon. Right. So yeah, them just like opening up a flap or something. You know, I, I saw this movie in the theater when it came out, and I swore I would never see it again. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it has a lot of scientifically good stuff in it. It has a lot of scientifically you know, crap stuff in it, but it's just a boring movie. Okay, yeah. what's our final flick about okay. Mars? Our final it flick is Red Planet, the film where Val Kilmer battles a robot panther on the surface of Mars, and that's the most believable part. <laughs> um, they, they're terraforming, and they find this dormant insect species that consumes algae that they've put on Mars and excretes oxygen. How would a dormant species excrete oxygen also when isn't they've the never algae had it. already excreting oxygen like why do they need this middleman bug thing yeah just I, sort it out for us sort it out for us yeah phil tell us what do you think <laughs> yeah you see here's another problem is is if you want to you want to seed a planet with an atmosphere hey you know dump algae on it and let it convert whatever native things are there into oxygen. You see, the problem is that takes a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the movie, they even say, as I recall, you know, hey, this is happening a lot faster than we expected. They go to Mars expecting to find it, it, the atmosphere to be still very thin and everything, but when they get there, it's breathable. And it's like, mm, no. But they even say in the movie they don't understand why, and then they figure out it, it has to do with all this other plot sort of uh, device stuff. Um, the thing is, we'd know even by then if, if Mars had a lot of oxygen in the air because we have things orbiting Mars. We have rovers on Mars. We have telescopes on Earth that would be able to detect this. Uh, Red Planet was another movie that tried really hard and got a lot of stuff right. I, my favorite scene in that whole movie is when they're, uh, they, they've got these rollable computer screens that they're holding up. They, they can f roll them up. They call them scrolls. And he's, he's got it showing sort of the Martian landscape using uh, uh, lander uh, photographs. And they're trying to match up where they are to the maps that they have. And at one point, they have to flip it around backwards. And Val Kilmer says, you see, your trigonometry teacher was right. Someday this will save your life. <laughs> and I thought, awesome. That was really cool. <laughs> Shout out to trigonometry. <laughs> so we've asked Phil what won't work when it comes to terraforming. Now we're going to ask him what does work. But first, a word from our sponsor. This episode of We Come From The Future is brought to you by Gamefly. Any sci-fi geek understands the importance of a healthy dose of video gaming. And so does Gamefly, the largest online video game rental service. With over 8,000 new and classic video game titles across all consoles and handhelds, Gamefly lets you play for as long as you like, with no late fees or due dates, and shipping is always free. Once you're done playing a game, send it back and Gamefly will send you the next available game on your list. If you really like the game you're playing, simply click Keep It on the Gamefly website and the game is yours at a discounted price. Gamefly will even mail you the case and manuals free of charge. Plans start at $15.95 a month, but we come from the future fans can get a 15-day free trial. Just visit Gamefly.com future and sign up. All right, so we've seen how terraforming doesn't work in films, but Phil, why don't you tell us a little bit about how ter terraforming might work in real life? Sure. I mean, what do you need to live? You need air, you need water, you need food, that sort of thing. Uh -huh. And everything else is kind of icing on the cake. So how do you make air on Mars? You, you need air and you need water. Maybe you can do both of these at the same time. There is some water on Mars under the surface and in the polar caps, but it's hard to get to. Right. To, to do this, maybe one way is to drop comets on the planet is that if you have uh, enough spaceships, you can go and you can go to a comet, which is basically just a giant frozen ball of water, mm -hmm. and then you divert it so that it bombards Mars, and you do this over and over and over again, you can deliver enough water to cover the surface in, in, in water. And then you can turn that into an atmosphere through complicated things, uh, but it's possible. Now this may do some damage to the planet, dropping giant bombs on it thousands of times, uh, but it takes a long time, too, and, and hopefully when it all settles out, you've got a planet you can live on. There are other things you can do. You, fusion reactors might be able to melt some of the ice. You might be able to use chemical processes to pump air. But no matter what you do, it's either going to be violent and fast, 
or uh, not violent and take a long, long, long time. Or and I think that's both, probably right? why movies haven't really tackled this that much. Yeah, what we need is like a really fantastic miniseries epic that's the terraforming of Mars and it can be like multi-generational and sweeping. That would be great. All right, HBO, there's your idea. Go out and make it. So thank you so much for being here, Phil. And once again, Phil is the owner, author, and janitor of badastronomy.com. And next up, we're gonna tell you the shocking truth about Martian sunsets. We're already seeing amazing new images of Mars thanks to the Curiosity rover that just landed there. And so far we're seeing mostly typical shots of the red landscape and the pink sky. But did you know that Martian sunsets are blue? Here is actual footage of a Martian sunset. And as you can see, and as NASA says, the sunset, when the sun actually goes down, is blue. And Lee, tell us why. So the red dust in the atmosphere is actually scattering red light. And so the light that's left over appears blue from the perspective of the rover's camera. So when the sun is setting, there's a lot of atmosphere between the sun and the camera, and all of those particles in the atmosphere are filtering out that red light, and you get the gorgeous blue sunset. It's the same principle that you get on Earth when you see a kind of reddish Martian-looking sunset, where you're seeing particles in our atmosphere scattering blue light. So basically, this is all just to say, I really cannot wait to see some of Curiosity's sunset photography. It's so romantic. It is. I'd like a romantic blue evening on Mars. We hope that you're watching everything Curiosity does just like we are. And while you're waiting for it to discover alien technology, why don't you just satisfy your inner geek and subscribe to the io9 YouTube channel right up there. Or you can find us here on, I on iTunes by searching for io9. And you can always find us actually here at Revision 3. And don't forget to share us with your friends because sharing is caring and we really do care, honest. Thanks for watching and we'll see all you Martians next week in the future.